Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, as always, for being with us as uh, you are joining the Zoom uh, Grand Rounds today. I want to just start off with a couple updates. I'll kick it off first with uh, uh, Dr. Ben Pinsky, who will talk a little about the, the newest, uh, some new news on a little bit of variants. Dr. Pinsky, thanks, as always, for being with us. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah. I just have a quick couple slides on uh, on the variants. Um, we are seeing entirely uh, the Delta variant, but of course the virus continues to evolve. Uh, just as a reminder, Delta is in Pango lineage B1617.2, um, and it contains important spike mutations L452R and T478K, which are in the receptor binding domain of the uh, virus spike protein. There are now, however, uh, a very large number of Delta sub sublineages that have uh, one or more additional mutations, um, both in spike and or in other parts of the genome. Uh, there's a total of 66 as of last night. And we've begun to identify these by sequencing at Stanford, um, including all the ones listed below. Um, the sublineage names are called AY and then the number. And some of them, actually, we haven't seen any, but then there's sub sub lineages with an extra period and number after it. Uh, importantly, A1, AY1 and AY2 contain another spike receptor binding domain mutation K417N that's found in the beta variant. Um, that has not become particularly prevalent. Um, the Delta variants, though, have made the news recently, um, particularly uh, because of this AY4.2 that's found uh, primarily in uh, the UK. This has two additional mutations in spike in the N-terminal domain. But as you can see here from uh, this epidemiologic curve, uh, it's rapidly increased in prevalence um, in the UK. So there is some concern about its uh, potential increased transmissibility. Uh, though experiments and other information is really um, limited at this point. So this is a, another variant to keep an eye on uh, in the coming months. Uh, so that's my update for uh, today. Uh, thank you, Errol, and everyone for listening. And I'll take questions in the chat. Thanks, Dr. Pinsky. I've said it a thousand times over the last almost couple of years now, but thanks so much for being with us and keeping <laughs> us updated as we as we continue on. Uh, I'll turn over next to Dr. Tamara Dunn. Thank you so much, Dr. Ozdalga. Um, good morning, everyone. First of all, um, happy Disabilities Awareness Month. And I wanted to just announce an incredible event that we have tomorrow to round out our Hispanic Heritage Month programming, we are going to be welcoming Dr. Rafael Campo from Harvard Medical School. He is an incredible um, physician and um, writer who will be coming to share some of his writings with us and do an inclusion rounds tomorrow, October 21st at 12 p.m. We will make sure that the registration is available to you in the chat. But this lecture will investigate the link between creative self-expression and healing and will enact the power of poetry to speak the unspeakable. We are extremely honored to have him coming to, to, um, to grace us with his, his writings. So we hope that you will join us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. That sounds like an amazing uh, event coming up tomorrow. I uh, just want to briefly mention we have next week Dr. Don Berwick, he's the President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute of, for Healthcare Improvement and former Administrator for the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services. He's going to be talking about the moral determinants of health. And a reminder, beginning of November, as we generally are now trying to do our first grand rounds of each month in person, as well as on Zoom, we have our own Dr. Ami Bhatt, who will be talking about, I don't have official title, but COVID-19 and, and GI involvement. So she'll be leading us there, followed by celebrating 50 years in the Center for Nephrology with Drs. Chang and Jamison. Next, I'd like, I'm really excited today to uh, introduce Dr. Carlos Bustamante. He's a professor of biomedical data science and professor of genetics, uh, genetics as well here at Stanford. Uh, much of his research has been focused on genomics technology and its application in medicine, agriculture, and evolutionary biology. He moved to Stanford in 2010, focusing to focus on enabling clinical and medical genomics on a global scale. 
He is particularly focused on reducing health disparities in genomics by one, calling attention to the problems raised by 95% of participants in large scale studies being of European descent. Uh, there's been a lot of articles uh, about him on this uh, and broadening representation of understudied groups, particularly in US minority populations and those from Latin America. Uh, he served as the inaugural chair of Stanford's uh, Department of Biomedical Data Science from 2015 to 2019. In 2017, Dr. Bustamante was appointed a Chan Zuckerberg investigator from 2011 to 16. He was a MacArthur Fellow. He also received the Stanford Prize in Population Genetics and Society uh, in 2016, a Sloan Research Fellowship in Molecular Biology in 27, two, 2007 to 9, and a Marshall Sherfield Fellowship in 2001 to 2. Dr. Dr. Bustamante has a strong interest in building new academic units, nonprofits, and companies. He's the founding director, uh, uh, along with Dr. Marcus Feldman of the Stanford Genetic, Stanford Center of Computational, Evolutionary, and Human Genomics. And he serves as the advisor for the US federal government, private companies, startups, nonprofits, in multiple, multiple areas. He's very, very busy. I can tell you that in learning so much about what he does, genomics uh, and uh, plant genomics as well. Uh, Dr. Bustamante is actually, you may see uh, occasionally people walking behind him on his uh, Zoom. And I asked him, where, where are you joining us from today? He's actually joining us from uh, Miami uh, his, at his biobank where he's collecting. Hopefully he'll share, uh, share a little bit more about that with us, uh, collecting uh, countless uh, data from genomics of people and, and testing for COVID. So, and he's been working a lot on the effects of uh, genetics and COVID and long COVID uh, as well. Um, so really interested to see that, uh, that work as it comes out. Uh, he's here to talk to us today on the topic, how do, we deliver, how do we deliver precision healthcare at scale for all? Dr. Bustamante, thank you for joining us from uh, Miami and thank you for being with us today. Uh, like, I am so thrilled to, to be able to, to, to talk back to the, the home campus. It's such a, a privilege and an honor to be here. Can, can you all hear me okay, Errol? This is transmitting Perfect. okay? Yes. Awesome. So um, I, I want to begin. Yeah, as, as Harold says, we're we're actually telecasting live here from from Miami. We are in the process of building a uh, a biobank that will hopefully store uh, millions of samples. And, and this is our our bay. Um, this is a, a project that is my uh, my passion project. I'm actually uh, on uh, what we're calling an industry sabbatical. I'm on leave from Stanford and in, in building this out. And I want to tell you all about it because it really brings together many of the things that, that I've been excited about and, and it has such deep Stanford roots. Uh, I also want to begin by um, you know, acknowledging uh, the sort of conflicts of interest. I, I, I am involved in, in operations of, of companies and as an investor and, and sort of disclose those here. Um, and I, I also want to make sure and, and really acknowledge all of my scientific uh, partners, I, I don't have time to list them all, or I, I spend the whole time just, just naming all the wonderful people that I've had a privilege to work with. I, I want to highlight, in particular, Dr. Pinsky, uh, who's been uh, a partner of mine now for several years. We've worked on a ton of projects. I love working with Ben. He's, he's awesome. And, and you and Ashley and Manny Rivas um, and, and, and Dr. Vicky Parikh, who, who've just been extraordinary co collaborators um, uh, over especially the, 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 the last uh, 24 uh, months as, as we've spun up um, uh, both the sequencing center and then the, the, the COVID efforts. Um, and, and then finally, uh, folks who have had the privilege of, of uh, I've had the privilege of, of having trained with me and then have gone on to do uh, a better, bigger thing. So um, Emer Kenny and Dr. Genevieve Vacek, I'll talk to them about her work. And then Alex Yanidis, who's, who's been a, a graduate student, postdoc, and, and now faculty at, at Stanford. And, and Alex and I continue to work closely together. So um, in the interest of rhetoric, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you what I told you, and I'm gonna tell you again. So I'm trying to build um, a, a very big participatory cohort. I'd like to get to 10 million uh, participants throughout Latin America and uh, Latinx and, and African diaspora populations in the United States. We are interested in trying to get a million uh, uh, at least a million of these genomes sequenced by the end of 2025. Those are our audacious goals. We are especially focused in underrepresented groups. Uh, we believe there's outsized value in, in, in um, and focusing on underrepresented groups. It's been at the core of what I've wanted to do for uh, most of my career. 
We were interested in bringing together digitized health records and the ability to recontact individuals in a living cohort um, to understand the genetics of health and disease, which we believe will guide uh, superior biological insights for all. And, and so the core activity of, of this is something we're calling the Biobank of the Americas um, in, in, in my warehouse here in Hialeah, Florida. So I grew up around here. Hialeah is, as we say in Spanish, la ciudad que progresa the city that progresses. This is the largest um, foreign born city in the United States. Uh, number one is Hialeah, number two is Miami. So, so I'm, I'm sitting here among uh, my, uh, my, my Cuban people, my Venezuelan people, my Puerto Rican people, my Colombian people, my Haitian people. Um, this city gets uh, reimagined uh, every, uh, you know, every year it gets reimagined. And so in this same place that, that, that I'm talking uh, from, there used to be a sewing factory and after there was a sewing factory, there was an airplane repair factory. And my neighbors, um, they do uh, a lot of the cabinet work all over Miami. And then my other neighbors, they do um, a lot of the, um, the tiles uh, in Miami. And then in the corner, I have the largest uh, fishmonger in all of the city. So I, I can tell you the, the wholesale price of Branzin, Branzino sitting here right here in Miami. So I'm so thrilled to be able to anchor this here from, from my hometown. And, and as you know, this is a, 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 deep, a deep passion of mine. And, and, and part of the rationale is that we, we have just not done ne nearly enough. So, so I wanna begin really by anchoring this in, in what has been um, the, the Dean's mission, uh, at least as he's articulated it to me when, when we just started the Department of Biomedical Data Science. Um, uh, the, the, the Dean said, look, um, I wanna build um, a, a platform for precision health, and that really is rooted in fundamental research in biomedical data science. And, and I think Stanford has, has been so true to that um, in, in many ways. Um, then that leads to transformative biomedical platforms and, and ultimately preeminent care, right? And, and so if we wanna be able to scale out um, precision health, which, which we define as, as you all know, to prevent, treat and cure disease precisely, um, we really need faster, better options. I mean, it's wonderful that, you know, our Silicon Valley friends can get access to the, the very best care in the entire planet and the entire universe at this point. Um, but, but we need to be able to scale that out so that my neighbors here in Hialeah Hospital get ju just as good care. Um, and, and that's just not the case right now. And, and partly we have phenomenal doctors right here in Hialeah. Um, we, we just don't have access to the same level of data. We don't have access to the same algos and, and we wanna be able to do better than that. So this is a slide that um, many of you, if, if, if you've had to sit through my lectures, have, have seen. I, I have not changed this slide. I've changed the background, uh, but I've not changed the core of this slide in about five years when we, just start, when we started the Department of Biomedical Data Science. This was a key idea. Namely, we don't know how to define biomedical data science, if we're honest with ourselves. We, we know it's a lot about bringing data together. And, and how you think about that problem really depends on where you sit on, on this uh, map. So as care providers, we're obviously interested in bringing together our electronic health record, our omics, our imaging, our pathology outcomes, et cetera, data. And, and that's sort of a no-brainer, right? It's a little bit like, as I say, sitting in retail and asking in the 1990s, should I throw up a website? Yeah, you probably want to throw up a website, but but if you just because you set up a website doesn't mean you're Amazon, right? So yes, we absolutely need to bring our data together. Having data silos doesn't make a lot of sense. We should be mining our data, Ab absolutely. But that's not just the only thing we should do. And and so much of what has driven the conversation has been the discussion between care providers and and I would call biopharma and insurance and this whole world of healthcare economics and qualities and dollies and which we pay for what when. And that's obviously very important. Uh, you know, it's at the core of, of how we operate the, the multi-billion dollar business at Stanford Healthcare. Um, but we also know there's a whole world of data that impacts care, impacts quality of care, certainly impacts outcomes, um, has a lot to do with social determinants of health that we don't have. Right. And, and eventually we need to get that data from people. And, you know, you, you all know as clinicians far better than I do that, you know, family history, family history, family history. And, and now how, how do we do that? We, we do that digitally and, and we get your history and your family's history and your family's family's history. And, and we try to integrate that and, and pull together the best models we can. Um, and, 
and at the core of this is that we want to turn all of these learnings into cures and treatment prevention. And, and the best way to do that is, is through pharma. Like we, we have to agree that, you know, the, the, the one element here that can bend the cost curve is, is the deployment of therapies before the disease gets um, too severe and ideally to prevent disease. And, and I'll give a couple of examples from what I've learned at Stanford from Josh Knowles and, and Nigam and others who, who work with FH and what I've learned in, in talking to colleagues at Vanderbilt and what they've learned in rare Mendelian diseases. But, but ultimately it's about finding the, the record data um, as, as it's accumulating to be able to make better decisions. And, and ultimately this will hopefully break through this logger job of how long it takes to get drugs to market. Um, and, and again, I don't need to convince you guys of, of this. We, we are not particularly accelerating this, right? Like, it's not like we've got, you know, as many drugs as there are cell phone lines connected. Like, we've been pretty stagnant. It costs more every year. COVID has taught us a ton about how to do things um, better, perhaps. And, and I would say the recovery trial has been a particularly North Star uh, internationally. And I would say Stanford um, has led nationally in, 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 a, in a major way. How do we take those learnings outside of our, um, of, of our uh, bubble and, and, and really push them out? And I think you know, this medical grand rounds online has been an extraordinary way to push, push that out. And, and I think now we can also build in, in ways that the data gets pushed out and not just presentations and, 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 and great policy and ideas, right? We actually can build software and systems. And, and one of those that, that we know about in our own uh, backyard is the extraordinarily interesting stuff that 23andMe is doing, right? So several years ago, they signed an agreement with Glaxo to um, begin to mine their uh, patient, um, to mine their consumer data and survey data and, and genetic data to identify potential targets and in conjunction with GSK, um, try, try to bring those forward. And there's a, there's a great uh, piece that came out about this time from Forbes on, on how these partnerships um, are going to affect how diseases are treated. And, and one of the big issues here is, you know, how are people going to worry about privacy? And, and is this going to be a concern? Uh, you know, we're, we're going to turn the crank on, on many aspects of this, but it's not necessarily going to bring everybody to, to the table. And there are many people who are naturally suspicious. Of, um, and, and many of those people are, are, you know, individuals who are already underrepresented in, in genetic research. So, so if we want to move this needle, we've got to think of important ways of doing that. And I've been thrilled to help, you know, anyone who listened to me on, on how to think about that problem. And this works. I mean, like, there's no doubt it works. It's, it's amazing it works. Like I, I would argue human genetics is our best tool for powering drug discovery for both safety and efficacy. And, and PCSK9 inhibitors I've used for years as the best example I know of, of going bench to bedside where you've taken a fundamental basic science finding, uh, the genetics of cholesterol, right? You know, won the Nobel prize, used it to find outliers, namely individuals who have won the genetic lottery, as it were, and, and have a knockout of PCSK9. And instead of, you know, having overexpression of PCSK9 and, and a, a familial form of dyslipidemia, they, they actually are protected. That's amazing. I mean, that is like exactly what you want to do in, in being able to translate this quickly in, into findings. And this has accelerated the path through trials. Um, now, this is taken to, to a new level by the ability to, to aggregate data at, at scale. And, and right now, there is no better place to be than the UK to do this. It is just mesmerizing. So the UK Biobank, um, which is a participatory cohort, this is a research cohort, um, has powered massive discovery and, and pharma has come together to begin to sequence these cohorts. And it's amazing, right? R Rory Collins and, and team uh, out of Oxford, um, the same folks that, that, that you know, brought you the AZ vaccine, um, you know, have, have done an incredible job of, of really creating infrastructure in Britain um, from a grounds up participatory cohort. I would also say the other element that Britain has done just beautifully well is Genomics England. I'm a huge fan of Genomics England. Genomics England was a 200 million pound investment to prove out the value of whole genome sequencing alongside 
the standard of care. So, so they basically took panel testing and exome sequencing and put it up right next to ordering up a genome. And at the end, got the NHS to commission some number of genomes every year. I mean, it's just amazing. So they're literally sequencing several hundred thousand genomes in the context of clinical care using AI to find who are the individuals that should be sequenced for what conditions, and then actually monetizing that in, in mesmerizingly good ways for everybody in Britain, because you're finding a lot about the genetics of Britain, and you're turning into medications that get used first in Britain and then uh, externally. So it has been a win-win-win. And, and here are just some examples. This is of, of the, the last time I looked um, from the 500,000 sample uh, project, they've already got hits for chronic liver disease, for multiple uh, autoimmune disorders, for neuropsychiatric disorders, for CAD. I mean, it's just awesome if, if you're British and, and happen to be, you know, part of the, the UK Biobank or part of the NHS, then this is really going to move the needle for you. Um, great. So like, can we just stop now? And like, wh why, why am I even talking anymore? Right? Like, we should just do what Britain's doing, right? That would be awesome. That would be incredible. Uh, unfortunately, Britain's the only country that, you know, in my opinion, has, has been doing this like repeatedly. I, I remember my friend David Altshuler getting very frustrated. He, he would say, we've been laughed by, <laughs> by a smaller country when the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium came out, right? So this has consistently happened. And where have we been? Nowhere, to be frank. And, and by we, I mean the people who don't happen to be British or Icelanders or Finns, like you're literally left out. It's like that simple. And it was a decade ago, you know, I'm, I'm getting older that we started calling attention to this. Like this isn't new, this is old. Like we've been saying, hello, this is an issue. Let's try to solve it. Let's try to bring consortia together. Let's, let's move the needle. And honestly, the, the one major thing that has happened is you know, China has jumped into the game extraordinarily well and done wonderfully well. And, and you know, God bless them. I mean, that makes all the sense of the world. You know, it's, a, you know, more than a billion people. You've got extraordinarily great technology. You know, if, if I were running China, I'd do the same thing. Of course, you're going to put, a, you know, a ton of resources into finding the genetics of common and rare diseases and how to translate that into medications. And, you know, that's where a lot of the excess that isn't today in European descent populations has gone. So Hispanics still make up like less than a percent and a half of the participants. African-Americans make up less than like a couple percent of the participants. And it's not for lack of trying. I mean, I'll tell you, we, we had um, a, a heck of a time um, trying to, to make this case. And, and, and partly because, hey, you know, clinical research takes time to translate. So the time to build these cohorts was 1965, 1975 birth cohort, but not today. Today's a little bit late to get started, you know, if, if you want to do this stuff longitudinally. So, so how are we going to solve that Gordian knot? Because the problem is, oh, there's not enough samples. So, you know, we'll work in the populations that we don't work well. E even in the UK, the underrepresented groups in the UK, they're smaller in number. There's not as many Asians. There's not as many African you know, um, descent populations. And, and so like, they don't even get analyzed. So you have the UK biobank data, but the underrepresented groups in the UK biobank sometimes get excluded from analyses because they're not enough numbers, right? That's a big deal. And, and, and luckily I think others have begun to see that this is a big deal. And when this works, it works extraordinarily well. So this is a slide from Genevieve Vacic. Um, she, she was the lead author on the PAGE project. The PAGE project was our country's biggest effort to date on understanding the genetics of these disorders and these traits. I mean, these aren't even disorders. A lot of these are just plain old traits in a multi-ethnic setting. So we took and we, we shook the freezer full at NIH. There were 50,000 samples total. And then repeat that. There, of all the things that NIH had access to, there was 50,000 samples that weren't European descent populations that we could use to, to study the genetics of these traits. And that included everybody, African-American, Hispanic, Native Hawaiian. We used the MET cohort. This was an incredible effort, um, but that was it. Like they tapped the freezers. And when you look at it, it made a huge impact, right? We, we understood a lot about the genetics of, of, of these traits. However, as we were doing those 50,000 for Paige, the world kept going. 
right? So, so this is a paper from Alicia Martin, who was a, a graduate student with me. She went to the Broad and worked with Mark Daly. It, and you can just look at the growth of the GWAS individuals, who's been genotyped over time, where are the investment going, where's the data? Yes, we've now done 50,000 for Page. Awesome, there are now like millions of individuals that have been done in the rest of Europe. And so obviously the genetics of, of those populations are better understood. And, and I will say it does come at the expense of others. So, so if we look at, for example, predictive power, and then again, I'm, I'm pointing you to, to Alicia's paper. I, I find this shockingly concerning, right? If I try to take a polygenic risk score that's been trained on um, European data and I translate it in the American setting, this is, you know, individuals from, you know, thousand genomes like Hispanics and admix and, yeah, the, it predicts somewhere on the range, depending on how European ancestry you are, right? Like that's the biggest determinant. Same for individuals of South Asian ancestry, individuals of East Asian ancestry, the, the, the translation is not as good. And then for individuals of African ancestry, it's particularly bad, right? Because you've only picked up on part of the shared history, that's the, the shared history uh, of, of all human populations, but you don't have what is specific and unique and wonderful about each of these populations. You've, you've literally left that out of the equation. So how do you expect it to translate? Like you can't just make it up. You have to go and do the work and collect the samples and, and do the genetics. Like you, you can't just, you know, guess at it. You can't impute it. And, and that's the big worry right, that I have. So, so the, the, the setup for this is, look, we've spent, 20 years since the Human Genome Project. It hasn't been one year, five years, seven years. It's been 20 years since the Human Genome Project. And we've learned humans are beautifully diverse species. We are amazing phenotypically and genetically. Just look at COVID response. Look at how varied COVID response has been. And that was something that is a trait that didn't exist, you know, 18 months ago. Um, instead of seeing this as an artifact of the data, we have to leverage these complex genetic landscapes to move forward inclusively. And, and again, I'm going to you know, give a lot of credit to Genevieve Vacic, who, who's led a lot of this work, first when she was in my team and, and then now at, at Hopkins. Um, and, and this is a logic that, that, that holds, but I'm an impatient person. And, and so I, I, I just don't want to keep waiting. And, and I wish I could tell you I have a lot of faith that the federal funding is going to move this in the right needle and we'll be able to build all the cohorts. You don't have to worry about it. I don't think that's going to happen. I really don't. I, I think unless we bring, you know, serious private capital to bear on the problem, this is just going to get worse. Inertia is inertia. You didn't build the cohort 20 years ago. It's going to be hard to, to, to really do a good job of catching up or even, you know, ameliorating. So, so those health disparities will widen simply as a function of inertia. So we have to jump from landlines to mobile. Like it's the only way. You're not gonna cable the rest of the world. You're gonna have to go to mobile. And, and I'm gonna invoke Master Yoda. Do or do not, there is no try. There is no try. You know, I'm done trying. We have to do or do not. And, and, and so this is where I'm gonna go back and, and again, from a rhetorical point of view, tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm literally trying to build a biobank for the Americas. I'd like to get to 10 million people that are part of a massive network that we can sequence at least, you know, a million people by 2025. Um, we, we need to focus on underrepresented groups who, who've been left out of, of this journey so far. I am very bullish that the digitization of health records and the ability to recontact people will really move us forward to understand the genetics of health and disease. And this will benefit everybody. We will have superior biological insights for all. You know, this isn't, you know, it's going to obviously wonderfully uh, benefit the underrepresented groups, but guess what? The majority groups will also benefit. This is like a Pareto optimum. Nobody's losing out here by us trying to build a 10 million person participatory cohort all throughout the Americas and including Latinx and African diaspora and, and other you know, people who've been left out in this country. Um, and so how are we gonna do this? Um, I, I'm, uh, you know, let's take lemonade and let's make lemonade from lemons. Um, I, I've learned so much um, from COVID. It, it has just been extraordinary to, to be part of this community. As, as, as you've all taught me about COVID and, and the work with Ben and Ewan in particular has just like literally been transformational. 
Um, I'll also add, I don't have time to tell you today about the incredibly important work that um, Jenny Frankovich and, and her team um, have, have led. We've been privileged to be part of, of their group and as, as they've looked at children with neuropsychiatric disorders. I became concerned about long COVID because we had worked on, on conditions um, that were post-infectious neuropsychiatric sequela. Uh, we had done an alignment algorithm and, and seen that you could subset patients based on medication. So we were primed to believe this. Um, I was concerned about Miss C. This doesn't go away. It was my biggest worry, and, and, and I hope I'm being a Cassandra a year ago, but that's part of the reason we started sequencing. Like, let's just see what we find. And, and I don't need to tell you, the sequela are there, especially for people who were hospitalized. Like, they don't go home and recover in two weeks. And so in order to, to make really and honor that experience and honor the, those patient journeys, we have to keep studying them and we have to enroll them and we have to do better, especially in, a, in an international setting. So I'm optimistic that we can, you know, really begin with COVID, build um, from the, the, the registries and, and, and move forward. The, the other thing is, you know, we really believe the public is enthusiastic about, you know, sharing biological insights in, in exchange um, for for you know giving a sample. So so if if we can get to a point where people have an acorn of trust in, in what we're doing, then then we can get to that you know um, um, you know precision health tree, and and that'll come from building trusts with diverse populations and with diverse you know um, groups and partners in Latin America, in the U.S., in in Canada, um, uh, you know you know throughout the entire continent and and beyond, and and. Obviously, a lot of this will will hopefully get in the hands of pharma. That's what we want. You know, it's going to be Regeneron who, who makes drugs from this. It's going to be Johnson and Johnson. It's going to be Abbey. It's going to be GSK, et cetera, et cetera. And and that to us is 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 the win. It, it is getting you know the best samples harmonized and and, and built into the, you know just an incredibly powerful network for for powering these kinds of studies. If five hundred thousand people from from a rock in 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 the in the North Atlantic, I love the UK. I've been there um, for years, and, and and I say that with with all the the, the love of my heart. You know, think about everything we can learn in Latin America. You know, there's so much in, in the billion people that 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 we share this continent with. And, and this is the logic, right? I mean, we, we really want to have a flywheel effect, you know, for, for those of us from, from the Valley, we, we like these flywheels. So you wanna link genotype to phenotype, we're gonna mine for insights, we update models, we continue to acquire samples and consent. And this is, you know, an ongoing process as, as we're building, um, you know, this, this network and we have insights that we can share with people, then, then we believe they'll, they'll share more with us. Um, and, and, and the logic is, is to bring together Biobank of consented samples. We need to start with new consents and consents that are um, uh, living consents, uh, ideally consents that are programmable consents, consents that are potentially even tied to blockchain technology and NFTs and other ways that in, into the future you, you can control this. We obviously need to bring compute to bear, and we believe we're going to bring compute to the data. We're not going to bring data to, to compute, so we need to work, work on federated systems, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, because if, if, if everything needs to be sent, you know, to Palo Alto or Boston or Terrytown, that's not going to scale. Like we, we really need to live in a distributed world and, and, and I want to help build that. Um, so our model, our logic comes from what we were able to do last year. And, and, and um, I think some of you've heard Ewan talk about this, some of you've heard Ben talk about this, that the last year has just been extraordinary for us as, as we've been able to, to sequence um, off the COVID discards. So, so Ben and Vicky just did a, a Herculean heroic effort. They literally were taking the swabs and we were getting DNA off those swabs and we were consenting people to link that to their electronic health record and then make it available to everybody who could, could, could contribute. And so, you know, the, the blood bank and their amazing team was able to HLA type and we were able to work with the CCI and get transcriptome data. And it's a beautiful, beautiful data set. I encourage you all to, to, to play with it. And, and I'll share some, some of our initial learnings from it. Um, this is the logic and here's the paper. You know, again, I, I really wanna um, give Vicky and Alex, you know, just, just 
um, the, the pointers here, they, they're the ones that did all of the, the, the heavy lifting, but we were really able to get host transcriptome and viral genome and HLA typing and low pass genome all from the swab. So, so if that holds and, and you can scale, that's amazing. I mean, that, that is a game changer in terms of having to send somebody a uh, test tube to spit in and get mailed back and scaled out like that. That's 50, $60. I'll tell you, I, I was enrolled here in El Palacio de los Jugos. You know, you can get a lot of good fresh juices here in Miami. I encourage you all to come out here. Superbly great juices. Um, and, and I'm sitting there and there was a team um, that was recruiting for a similar study. And so they, you know, consented me. It took, there were eight people there. They took a swab. I filled out a survey. Then they gave me a $75 gift card. You know, they didn't even consent me for genome sequencing. So, you know, there's a ton that we're leaving on the table as the way that we currently do work. But if we think about the repurposing of the healthcare system itself, it is the way to do research, as, as many of you know. So the, the most interesting finding that, that I want to highlight from, from our point of view is just how you, do you disentangle the role of genetic ancestry um, from the genetics of, of the COVID susceptibility. So, so what I'm showing you here is a bar plot, kind of like a 23andMe plot that, that has all of the COVID positive patients and then the COVID negative. So, so we luckily were also able to sequence COVID negatives and that's great because we got 200,000 COVID negatives and I've been telling Ben, we got to store them and, and make reuse of those for, for the rest of the clinics. Um, and, and when you compare just broad ancestry between the COVID positives and the COVID negatives, you, you don't need to be a statistician to see that there's a massive overrepresentation of individuals with indigenous American ancestry among the COVID positives. And, and you knew this as, as the clinicians treating the patients, right? This is an overwhelming signal. And, and it's an overwhelming signal for one good reason, which is who can shelter in place during the pandemic in Silicon Valley and who can't shelter in place. I mean, again, look, look at the, the very wonderful job that individuals of South Asian ancestry did in, in sheltering in place. They are massively underrepresented among the individuals who were, who were COVID positive. The same thing could be said of individuals of East Asian ancestry, right? And that is not surprising given what we know about who could shelter in place and who couldn't shelter in place during the, the pandemic last year. The, the other thing we could do is pull this together into a network model and include COVID severity as part of the model. And so when, when all is said and done, you, you can get to a really interesting you know, time course that looks like this. So, so that the top here is self-reported ethnicity, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, and then look at the bottom. I mean, you live this, you live through this. You know this better than I do. Who was getting hit in the early part of the pandemic? It wasn't the same people who were getting hit in May and June and July, right? And you literally read that out from the DNA of the COVID swap. And that to me is extraordinarily powerful. Um, and of course, it's not all social determinants of health. It's not all who can shelter in place and who can. We are a beautifully diverse species. And that means that by happenstance, some of us are born winning by no fault or gain of our own. We just happen to be born with the genetics that protects in some directions and not others. And one of these was an extraordinarily interesting HLA hit that was protective and in high frequencies in South Asian populations. And I would argue, and we're beginning to look at, you know, how much of a role did protection play in the first part of the pandemic against Delta? Because there wasn't a lot of COVID in South Asia where there's isn't high frequencies. And it shouldn't surprise us that in a recurrent world where we've been dealing with coronaviruses um, since time immemorial, I would say since the Silk Road, we've, we've been dealing with the transmission of, of infectious diseases that kill some people and not others. Um, and viruses that lead to disease in some and not in others. It shouldn't surprise us. We've known this from other um, you know, um, genetics of, of host susceptibility that there are genes involved, right? CCR5, Delta 32, I mean, give me a break. We, we've known about this from HIV. So why would it surprise us that by happenstance, this doesn't also happen for coronaviruses? And the logic here though, is that we begin with the COVID, but of course this can lead into many, many other insights. And no place has done this better than Vanderbilt 
Oh my goodness, for how long have we said, geez, Louise, I wish we had something like BioView at Vandy. They have just learned so much. And, it, and, and, I, and I say all the time, Lisa Bastaracci is our country's premier EHR whisperer, maybe, maybe next to Nigam. Um, and, and Lisa and, and Josh Denny have just built a beautiful system that takes in the patient record data and looks for individuals who may be suffering from a genetic condition and then verifies it because they've been able to genotype with opt out for, for a decade before they even had an EHR, like they had an EHR before Epic, right? This is how forward thinking Vandy was on this. And, and I'll tell you, here's the logic, Here, here's the way I think about it, right? Namely, patients with cystic fibrosis utilize the healthcare system in predictable ways that machines can recognize. Right, so, so all of these um, are aspects of, of how you might be able to describe the, 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 the logic of, of, of how you identify somebody at risk. But, but nothing better than, as Nigam says, claims data. You know, I've heard him say anything above $50, we're gonna submit a bill. So there's tons of information that may be useful here. Well, guess what? When Vanderbilt ran this, they could absolutely separate the patients who they know have cystic fibrosis from those that didn't. But not everybody who had cystic fibrosis was already registered as hashtag cystic fibrosis in the database. Maybe that doesn't surprise you. You know, 20 to 30% under diagnosis rate. You know, they actually identified somebody at 65 who has cystic fibrosis. You know, they should probably sequence to see if they also have another protective allele somewhere, because it's amazing you got the 65 in this day and age with cystic fibrosis. So what other conditions? Well. Marfan syndrome, achondroplasia, you know, hemochromatosis, leaf romani, they all had lift. You could absolutely find undiagnosed patients for all of these in the data. The one beautiful exception that proves the rule is PKU. Why? Because everybody gets their health advice from the back of a Diet Coke can. You know that if you don't um, if, you, if your kid has PKU, don't give them phenylalanine. And, and luckily, we've done an incredible job of preventing the adverse effects um, you know, of, of intellectual disability in, in PKU positive by deploying you know, public health intervention that is like literally putting stuff on the back of a Diet Coke can. I wish it were that easy for everything else. It's not, but the logic holds. We can look, we can find individuals, and we can put them on the right therapy. And, 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 and Vandy's done awesome, but so has Stanford. I mean, I, I, I wanna be, you know, let's give some credit where credit is due. I learned about this from, from Josh and Nigam. Um, you, you all know that, that Josh is, you know, the, the, one of the world's leading authorities on, on familial hypercholesterolemia. And, and he's been doing more than, you know, anybody I know. He's an, an absolute, you know, just gem of a human being to identify patients and work with the foundation and get people reimbursed. Because guess what, like 90%, are still undiagnosed. And many of these patients find out they have FH when they come in to your clinics with a, you know, with an adverse event, you know, they've unfortunately had a stroke early on, or, you know, God forbid, they've had a heart attack in their forties. You know, this is awful. This is absolutely awful. So let's get ahead of this problem. And, and Josh and, and Nigam have, have done an incredible job. They've built this wonderful system with the FH Foundation that allows you to bring together tons of data and they have a synthetic map that allows you to find whether an individual in a practice is, is likely to have FH or not. I mean, this is, this is magical. This is absolutely magical. This is how the world should operate. Of course, what's wonderful is this technology that took the brilliance of Josh and, and the brilliance of Nigam coming together and building a team can be replicated and, and done by others. And, and that's a good thing. That's, that's not a bad thing. That's exactly what you wanna see in life. And, and so I am thrilled. Nothing makes me happier than to see that when Geisinger and the FH Foundation came together to, to build it like this, you know, that they're able to power something like, you know, color genomics before they were doing COVID testing was offering a $99 FH screening. Like, that's amazing. Like we should literally just be figuring out which of the patients in the clinics are eligible for the screening. Like we should put some AI in the front, filter it out and, and, and feed it into the sequencing machine. And, and luckily, I believe that that's a big part of what Ewan and, and team are wanting to do. And this now scales in software for everybody else with a smartphone and the ability to spit or now the ability to go get COVID tested to potentially be part of a network that can catch. Them. And that's the world I wanna live in and I wanna help us build. 
And, and to me, this is, you know, Clay Christensen's innovator's dilemma. If, if, you, if you've ever read this, this wonderful book, um, it, it's got example after example. In fact, it's before <laughs> cell phones and landlines, actually. But you know, a nice example is cell phones and landlines. Namely, you start with a product that is, you know, the low end of the market. It, it's like not going to be good enough to really replace the existing technology. And, and before you know it, the disruption, you know, it, it, it takes you out, you know, and, and nobody's buying landlines anymore. Right. Like even in business, people don't buy landlines. You're, you're running, you know, a billion dollar startup taking calls from VCs off your cell phone. You're not, you know, putting in a bunch of, you know, Cisco um, routers if you don't need to. Um, and 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 like this happens ridiculously fast. Like this isn't this is only 13 years worth of data between 2004 and 2017. We went from houses holds that only had cell phones and 92 percent had a had a landline. To them, to them crossing. And, and today, by far, most people have cell phones and not many people, you know, are buying new landlines. And, and in some sense, and I'm going to be cheeky here, um, we could be intermediate that way too. And, and, and that's not a bad thing. I, I really want to live in a world where data platforms partnered with people who want that data can disrupt our best ability to do drug discovery at Stanford. We, we should be able to, you know, up our game in, in some sense to, to, to keep up with that. And, and you know, lest you think I'm, I'm kidding, if, if you just look at 23andMe's public statements, um, they're, they're gunning for this. They, they're looking to get millions of subscribers on their system, validating, you know, a ton of targets. Um, Adam Auten, who was a former uh, postdoc of mine, who's now you know one of the big VPs of genetics at, at 23andMe, gave a beautiful talk in, in, in the Biostats workshop. And he said, I got 99 problems, but finding targets ain't one of them. I got a gazillion targets. I have, I'm working you know, my team to, to get to biology, and that's a wonderful problem to be at, right? So now again, I, and, I, and, and, I, and I'm very supportive of what 23andMe has done, their customer database is not representative of, of Latin America yet, you know, and, and, and so we, you know, I, we think there's an opportunity and we think there's a massive opportunity, particularly in places where people are ready for this. You know, when we did a pilot several years ago in Miami Children's Hospital on 300 families that got um, pharmacogenetics for codeine, um, all 300 had the same question. Um, yeah, I get it, whether or not the kiddo gets codeine. By the way, what other medications can you tell me about? Because we Hispanics, we love our medication. Like we're, we're all over it. Like we know what our well is on. We know what our tias are on. We know what our kids are on. We're like a walking pharmacopoeia. So, so this is like, you know, music to our ears. Um, and, and part of this is that data mining is now far more lucrative than, than oil extraction. And, and you just like, it's, this is not even like uh, um, simile anymore. Like it literally is true that, that the biggest companies in the world are the data extraction companies. They used to be the oil companies. When I was in college, they were the ones that had cash on hand. They were the ones that had the big balance sheets. Today, it's all the tech companies. And of course, they're going to go mine health data. It's the number one industry in this country. So, so how would they not mine health data? And, and so being from Venezuela, I can't help but make the following argument. Genomic data lakes are more valuable than all the oil in Lake Maracaibo. And I'll remind you, Lake Maracaibo has two important, you know, um, places in my heart as a Venezuelan. Number one, it was the big part of where, you know, we, we, we had an extraordinary, you know, production that, that, that lifted the country out of poverty between 1925 and 1985. And, and the other is where you mapped Huntington's disease was around Lake Maracaibo and, and the villages there. Today, Venezuela sells $13 billion, not even, you know, $13 billion in oil to the United States. Uh, Humira is a $20 billion a year drug. So we're, we're not even the second biggest drug. And that's from all the oil that you could extract out of Lake Maracaibo. Imagine all the data you could get out of Lake Maracaibo. I'm sure you could turn that into, you know, um, the, the similar kinds of findings. And that's what we'd like to do. Um, so this is going to require more than a passionate, you know, guy in Miami with freezers, like his 
neighbor who runs the, the, the largest fish market here. But we need, we need new tools. We need new ways of consenting people. We need to build you know, a, a, a better way. But luckily, Web 3.0 is here. Like, there's no turning back. If, if we think finance is, is going to be um, um, you know, distributed, and, and, um, then, then why, why would you think anything else is, is going to stay siloed up? It's just not going to be the case. We really do need to prepare to live in a federated world. And, and for me, um, that's, you know, build, building tools, building coins, building logic, building, you know, th this is one example, this is from several years ago that I cribbed off the internet, you know, what would a health coin look like? You get onto a plan, a smart contract that accumulates over time and you get, in this case, it was like before NFTs, like you'd get NFTs, not coin, you know, let's, let's you know, let's, let's update the lingo, but the logic stays the same, right? You have a wallet, it accrues credits, those credits go in one direction or another, you have control over your information. And, and the, the last bit of this is, is, you know, big data is accelerating the push in precision medicine. There's just a ton of data. It's, it's poorly structured. It's a, it's a, a sort of hurricane of data. How do, how do we pull that together? We need new methods. And, and this is one that uh, one of my uh, graduate students developed. This was the, the logic behind you know, centralization of data. So we can either bring it all together and, and do all the analysis in one place. So all the samples get shipped to Stanford or the Broad or Terrytown, and that's where the analysis gets done. Or we share some stats, which is what we did for COVID, right? Everybody ran their analyses. We shared the statistics around where in the genome we had hits and you bring those together to build synthetic maps. And that's great. I mean, that, that is the way to, to, to break through data silos, but an even better way is what, um, what we called Hydra, which is highly decentralized regression analysis that it's just iterating between these two. So you can imagine every data store doing their analysis and, and back and forth. So that, that's the last bit of the logic. I want to end by reminding you what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build a 10 million person participatory cohort all throughout Latin America with at least a million genome sequence by 2025. I need your help, please. We really need to get to underrepresented groups. We need to build new ways of integrating, digitizing a health record with the ability to recontact and mine. This will help us get to improvements of the genetics of health and disease, and this will lead to biological insights for all. Um, I, again, I want to acknowledge, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, you know, floating on the, the shoulders of giants here. I've learned everything I know from you and, and Ben and, and, and my great, you know, folks that, that have had the, the, um, the, to train with me. Um, and, and, and I thank them for, for all that they've taught me. And, and now we're excited to, to have a little bit of, you know, um, seed to, to get started. So thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that, that you all may have. Dr. Bustamante, uh, thank you for that amazing presentation. You can, I enjoyed the way you spoke about the enthusiasm you had as much as the content you mentioned at the beginning. This is a passion product project. It clearly is uh, based on this, the enthusiasm you have for this. So thank you so much for sharing this amazing work. Uh, Dr. Pinsky, Ben's, Ben's asking, where'd you get that photo? You might have to send him a copy of it later. <laughs> I was going to say, I think COVID's taken off a little bit off the top for Ben. So uh, anyway. <laughs> that, that's right. Thanks, Carlos. <laughs> you look great, man. No, I'm kidding. You know, that, that's what I like. Ben in the lab. That's awesome. He, he... Yeah, excellent. And uh, so I want to get in. We have some questions coming up in the remaining time. So I want to get into those now. Dr. Goldstein's asking, uh, Professor Bustamante, in thinking about large genomic databases and diversity, could you comment on the Department of Veteran Affairs Million Veterans Program data? Yeah, um, awesome. And, and I would say, um, you know, MVP has been a great replication um, cohort for, for this. And, and I, I'll point um, to, to Tim Simmies, who's got an incredibly beautiful result around 9P21, which is the number one, you know, CAD hit in, in European uh, populations. It, it turns out not to replicate in, in African-American populations. And, and literally, when you look at individuals of double African ancestry for the associated allele, the odds ratio is one. Like it doesn't replicate. That is an incredibly important finding. That means that if you're trying to do the polygenic risk score calculation, you need to know how to do this um, uh, well. So, so I, I would say it's incredibly important. 
um, part of it. I wish they would share data better. I'm going to be honest with you. It's 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 a uh, it, it is rightly locked up, and and I you know and and I understand from you know uh, I support the the the, the VA, uh, and and obviously we've got to take care of our veterans number one. Uh, but, but I wish we could get you know more federated learning off of those systems like Tim is is beginning to do. So I'm, I'm a big fan. I just want to know more. Uh, next question, uh, Dr. Chu is asking, ancestry screening from nasal swabs if for only $99 is great. Could you offer a $98 rebate to people who have underrepresented genomes? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we'd like to be able to push um, this through um, as many as, as we can. So the, the whole logic is um, we, we should be able to, to serve this up in, in, in the... Um, for example, UK Biobank, none of those participants paid to be part of that project and, and um, they're receiving those results back. So, so we wanna push in that direction. Our whole goal is um, the more data you share, the cheaper it'll be to, to, to get data uh, in, in your hands as well. And, and, and this is part of the reason you haven't had more diversity in some of these direct to consumer cohorts. $99 is a limit to some people. $79 is a limit to some people. $29 is a limit to some people. We know some patients don't come to Stanford because of parking, right? Why do you think they're gonna pay $99 for you know, an ancestry test? So we wanna make it faster, better, cheaper for everybody. Excellent. I have a question here from uh, uh, Mavis Entem. Uh, Mavis, I hope I got your pronunciation right. I looked it up, but uh, Mavis asks, the UK has universal health care, so individuals don't have to worry about health care and insurance discrimination when their genome is sequenced and issues are discovered. Are you working with legislation to address this potential issue with discrimination in the states to protect individuals who offer up their genetic information? Yes. So, so in the United States, we have um, the, you know, we have Gina. So, so in fact, it is illegal for your genetic information to, um, you know, be, be used kind of against you in, in underwriting health, um, and, and, uh, disability as well. It doesn't hold for life insurance. And, and I'm going to be provocative and, and say that may be a feature and not a bug. Um, if, if you were to build human Geico and you had people share more information, you could come to arbitrage that would improve the pool for everybody. And at one point we were trying to build um, FH life insurance. Could you do a model for that? Uh, if you were to commit to put people, you know, early on the right treatment, um, you know, there, there's an argument to be made because you know, your life insurer is very aligned with you paying premiums for a long time. So, so they want to keep you alive a long time and, and have you pay more premiums. So if, if you could, you know, stylize that, I think it'd be good. Um, I, I see there's a question here um, about sharing the slides. Yeah, I know that the, the, the slides are uh, made available and they're going to be on YouTube. I figure people, you know, would, would like to share them so that, that you have my, my, my permission to do that. Great, thanks so much. And uh, Dr. Yen's also asking uh, about the about your data earlier about shelter in place. Was that data really all from shelter in place, or ability to do so, or also is there an inherence uh, to masks that'll play a role? Great question. I, I uh, thank you for for pointing that out. I was probably speaking quickly. I think we're talking about the whole compendium of you know adherence and ability to adhere. I mean, you know, it, you know, it's 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 a funny um, it's a funny term when we say adherence because Sometimes you literally, I mean, you can't. If you have to go Uber and work, you have to work Uber and work, and you can't shelter in place. So, um, but but I do think obviously the 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 use by mask and uh, vaccination now are, are the biggest determinants. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, we, we can't um, continue to understand the genetics of, of these traits. I mean, after everybody's vaccinated, you will still get people who are sick and and who break through. And I would be surprised if genes didn't play an outsized role once you've done the best you can to to deliver the best care for everybody. Great. Dr. Bustamante, as we neared we the last minute, I was hoping to ask this, uh, not a brief question, but uh, about this huge project, 10 million people, there must be a huge uh, outreach to this. How are you getting people's attention? And I really want to ask a question more so with the time left is you mentioned briefly, help us get the word out when you stop speaking. Is there any call out or anything we can do yeah to help share this news? Um, well, I mean, right right now we're in the conceptual phase, to be, to be honest, we're beginning to do pilots. We're, we're starting to take what we've learned at Stanford and and, and push out. Uh, Miami is is where I'm trying to pilot this. I've, I've had 
a lot of um, just wonderful reception in my hometown. I've, I've gotten to meet um, both, both of the mayor, the the mayor of the city, and the and and the um, and the mayor of the county. Uh, we're we're looking um, for for local partners, but but of course Stanford remains just a premier place. So so um, we're still looking for collaborators. We'll have access to lots of interesting material and samples. Our our goal is to return the data. Um, to all of our academic partners as quickly as we generate it. It'll always be free and you guys can keep the, the data to, to be used in, in that way. And then our goal is by building um, more and more um, of a distributed network, particularly with Latin American academics and hospitals in Latin America, then we're just you know beginning to, to lower the, the barrier to entry here. So I, I appreciate it. I would also love any feedback, um, uh, critical comments, uh, welcome as well. Um, you, you all have my, my, my Stanford email and and it's um you know just just a please um would love to hear from you thank you dr rich um thank you so much i hope you can come back and and update us uh when when you have data and and, and, and we really appreciate again the enthusiasm and everything you're doing thank you so much for being with us I, I, there are a couple of questions sorry dr Woods and, and uh, dr bonilla it's at past nine so we'll probably close it up now uh, but thanks for those questions as well. Dr. Bruce Monte, thank you again for being with us. I hope you uh, continue to have fun out in, in Miami and we'll hear from you soon. Thank you so much. Really, it's a, a privilege and a pleasure. And, and thank you to Stanford for, for all the support and everything you've given me over the years. I, you know, I can't say enough about the institution. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of the week.